by those that knew her, Sharon Presley could shoot as good as any man and work besides them too. When her husband Doyle would hunt, she would go as well, but just not on the foggy and drizzly morning of December 13, 1998, when Sharon Presley told authorities she dropped her husband off on the side of Highway 24 just before the rest stop in Montego, where she said he would then walk to a hunting spot in the woods. It was still dark, she remembered, because the Hardys were still closed and it being before 6 a.m., she was right. For a Tennessee winter day, it would still be dark for another half hour. A nagging question of why, when the body of her husband was found, did he not have a flashlight on him? How would it even be possible for him to walk up through the wood? Not to mention this being the busiest part of Interstate Highway where 24 crosses 41A with the Waffle House in plain sight. Just looking at the spot with the hundreds of trucks and cars going by every minute, you'd have to wonder how the spectacle of an armed man jumping out of a car would all go unnoticed. Sharon told Tennessee Bureau of Investigators agent Larry Davis that she'd arranged to pick her husband up at 9 a.m. at Wren Road, but that, but that when she went to go pick him up, he was not there. She said she'd go back to the trailer on Harbarger Road that they were staying and kept going back every 15 minutes like she said Doyle told her to, but to no avail. It would not be until late afternoon that she called the sheriff that her husband was missing. And by the time she did, it was too late for a search party. It would not be until the next day that the body of Doyle was found lying beneath a tree, dead from a single gunshot wound, his own rifle sticking straight in the ground as if Doyle had been shot while in a tree and then fell to the ground. At least according to state's agent Larry Davis, that is. Five years later, Sharon Presley's story did change, though. She said instead of going back to her trailer after dropping her husband off, she went to a motel in Montego, and that's where she met Wayne Grimes, and he came out and told her that he had just shot her husband. A story that would lead to the conviction of Wayne Grimes. However, does either one of these stories that Sharon has told tell the truth? The one where she went back and forth from the trailer to the pickup spot, or to the motel? As one Grundy person tells it, he saw Sharon Presley at the l, &L Market up in Altamont, dressed in camouflage as if she was out hunting. She bought three gallons of bleach, and then she left. I want to talk to you about, uh, well, the time in the past is uh, back in 1998 on December 13th. And I think you know that day by now. Um, and, and if you could just tell me, start from the beginning, and uh, tell me about that day. Okay, uh, my name's Billy Ray Griffith. Uh, at December the 13th of 1998, I was working at l, &L Market uh, down at the junction, otherwise known as Colmont, Tennessee. And I started my shift that morning about 7 a.m. And along between 7.15, 7.20, something like that, I didn't really look at the clock. Uh, I was in the coolers. That was one of the first things I did when I started my shift. It was stock the coolers. Well, I, I heard the bell go off, and I knew someone had come in the store. So I came out of the coolers, and then I seen this person back there on the shelves, and uh, I recognized it was a lady. Didn't know who until after I went to the register. And when she came to the register, uh, she had on a black hat, and her hair was pulled back in a ponytail, and she was dressed in camouflage and a vest and uh, a thermal undershirt. And she had come in, and she had picked up three gallons of bleach, and she wanted to know if we had any more. And I said no, and I made a comment, I, something like, you know, it must be having an awful lot of dirty clothes, you know, to be buying bleach on a morning like that. And she didn't really have much to say about it, and she left, uh, made her purchase, and she left. I mean, what, what do people dress like that for? Deer hunting. They deer hunt in that kind of outfit, so, so like yes. if she was outside or something like that. And did you know? Did you know that people use bleach to clean up blood? Well, yes, now I do. But at that point in time, I never thought nothing about anything like that. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So there was no reason to be suspicious, I guess, of anything. No, not at that point. No, not because you didn't. Yeah, like yeah, just somebody who needed to do a lot of laundry, I guess, or something. Yes. Yeah. Huh. Well, and uh, so, and that had, and who did you did you tell this to anybody? What happened like throughout the you know like. Uh, Nothing really happened. Nobody was charged for the murder for five years. Uh, so right, and but then I had moved on to Georgia, where I've been for the last 21 years. So it wasn't until uh, he was indicted, and my mom called and told me that he was indicted. Right. And I said, for what? But she wouldn't talk. 
Right. She would not talk. She said, we've been told by Larry Davis, the TBI agent, that we better not be talking, said it could go against Wayne's family or against his case. Yeah. So she never did say anything until after the trial, and he was convicted of murder for Doyle Presley, and I, that's when I'm like, Mama, you know, there's no way. And, you know, because it was just common knowledge that I worked at the junction at that time. And, you know, and immediately when she said that he was indicted, I'm like, Mama, there's no way he can be guilty of something like that. And I told her what I knew, and I said, y'all need me to come up and testify. I said, please, let me do it. I said, I'll be glad to come up there. Talking to Chris, Sharon Presley's son. I mean, they gave Mama a lie detector test, but she failed it. But, I mean, if she, if she failed the lie detector test, why is she out free? And why was she allowed to testify? Your mom has all, all, always maintained that she didn't know anything more than she knew, that, she, that, that, uh, that Wayne had nothing to do with it. And then when they threatened with uh, prosecuting her, right? And that, right. That's when she was, she's the only one who, came, who had that story. She's the only one who said Wayne admitted it to her. Uh, it's just your mom that said that. She had never said that before. It was the only time she ever said that was after she was threatened with being convicted. Because Larry Davis yeah. came to her and said, we're going to convict you. We're going to take you to trial if you don't that, do this. That, see, that's what pissed me off, DK. Okay, okay? when well, I read that. Okay, that they told her pre bargain for my mother. Yeah. When it comes to a first-degree murder case, there shouldn't be no plea bargain. No, there shouldn't. Okay, there shouldn't be no plea bargain. No. You either done it or you didn't. Exactly. I, I, it's a, okay. I know, that's what I noticed right away. I was like, this is really bad. They should they should not be doing this. Uh, right. So, but now, I mean, why? Okay, because I read one paper stating that they said that they had enough evidence to prove my mom, a first-degree murder. That's right. Why didn't they take her? That's exactly okay. right. Then I read another paper stating that that they gave Mama a plea bargain if she will come up with a statement stating that Wayne Brown shot my dad, then she will go free. That's pretty much the deal. Uh, yeah. Tell yeah. uh, the situation with Christy and Kevin. Okay. Christy and Kevin. Okay, I'm going to tell you the story about this, okay? Okay. What caused me and Christy to not to talk for about four years, okay, I don't know how, I mean, uh, different people probably take, take it in a different way than I did, but this is this is the way I took it. Uh, she told me, she goes, she goes, I'll tell you what, she goes, I'll bury you just like I did my dad. I'll bury you like with your daddy. And I'm like, excuse me? And... Then she hung up, and then she wouldn't talk to me. She befriended me. She uh, would not accept my messages, blocked me, done everything she could possibly do and for four years. Right? The gun come in the house, too. But. The what? And, and, and as a matter of fact, when I was there with Christy and Kevin, we were living in the house right beside that gas station in Winchester. All right? <laughs> First day of juvenile. Well, it was juvenile. Kevin was going to take Asia hunting. So a gun came through the house. It was a 243 automatic. So first words came out of my mouth was, uh, I don't like a 243, because that's what shot dead and killed him. The next day, that gun came up missing. You mean, it, it, how did it, what do you mean it came up missing? He took it out. He took it out of the house. He took it out of the house. But and, it was not, and it was not seen after when his daddy got shot through the left arm with the heart and lungs and stopped in his chest with a T-43. That's okay. Okay, there was only two T-43s I've ever seen in my life. Okay, one of them was Juanita Caldwell had one, that's what she shot, and one that uh, Kevin brought in that. So how long okay. How long after uh, the murder was that when you saw the gun? Oh, shit. You 25? 
I was. I'm trying to think. How old was that? I got with you right after. Um. Dylan was a year old. That would be 15 years ago. 05. Oh, 05 is when we seen the gun. Yeah, 05 is when we seen okay. the gun. So you saw the gun in 05. So that was a, that was a few years later, obviously. Okay. How, and they yeah, just I, brought I, the gun in the room? I mean, just out of nowhere? Oh, uh, uh, it just came through the, through the front door. The gun? He was, he, he, yeah, he was carrying the gun. Yeah, yes, he, sir. Oh, he just... Years later, obviously. Okay. How, and they yeah, just I, brought I, the gun in the room? I mean, just out of nowhere? Just, uh, just, uh, it just came through the, through the front door. The gun? He was, he, he, yeah, he was carrying the gun. Yes, he, sir. Oh, he just he walked did, in? He, he didn't did know you were there or something? Bar, yeah. He didn't know you were there? Yeah, I was living there. Oh, you were We had no place to go at the time. Oh, maybe he just wasn't thinking or something? Huh. I don't know. Oh, you just don't know. Okay, but, that's fine. But the remark that Christian made... Yeah. Kind of made me, made me realize. Like I said, well, why was a lot she... of stuff being said. I mean, you know, if you if you leave a bait in water for so long, yeah. eventually someone's going to bite it. Yeah. I got okay. It. And and down this line and everything, adding things up, you know, one and one and one and one, and the next thing you know, something comes up. Yeah. That rings my bell. I can't tell how your mom could have been with him for so long and do all the memories the way. Right. But how could my mother be with somebody for over 25 years and just throw all the memories away? When he dies, she hates his guts. Right. And then right after he dies, she hates his guts. What's going on? Did you know about the insurance money and all that? And uh, Well, I didn't know that until a long time after. Heck, I don't even know anything about the insurance money. Okay, uh, you know, to be frankly, we, I don't know how much my mama got. Uh, I do know she did get some because she started going hog wild buying everything. Right. Okay, uh, and that's like I told Joe. I said, you know, I was never even offered or even asked to take a polygraph test. And Joe told me, he goes, Chris, you weren't even a suspect. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, hey, I'm willing to do it. I think Kevin and Christy and Okay, did y'all ever give Christy or Kevin a lie detector test? All right. Um, nobody, nobody has given them a lie detector test, and nobody... Okay, nobody why, has, why haven't they done that? Well, because the, administ the administration uh, is... Uh, would have to do that, so, I mean, the DA would have to enforce that, I would think, so, yeah. I mean, even after my daddy got shot and killed, I had wait. Okay, and I'll never forget the job I had to him But, uh, yes, Wayne, he, he, he was helping me. Yeah. I mean, I had no help after my daddy got shot and killed. He gave you money. I mean, Wayne gave me money to help me when I was young. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now, you're not going to do that if something... If you just shot the boy's daddy, okay. I mean, you just, you just don't do that. No, I mean, he cared about Wayne him. was crying at the funeral. Same as me. I went berserk. If you was only there, you would know. You were seeing what happened. Right. I went. I, I went crazy. Right. But you know who? Uh, you know. You know who only calmed me down? There were two. There was. There were. I think about it. Were three people in that. In that funeral um, uh, home, that could calm me down. One was Dean Lay, the other one was Wayne Grimes, and the other one was my grandma. I see. Yeah. Okay. My grandma held me. My mama didn't. Okay. Mama wasn't even, didn't seem like she was crying at the funeral. Yeah, she may have been upset. But she wasn't crying. I went berserk. Hey, they couldn't even lower the casting in the ground until I left. Yeah. Because when they started lowering it down, they had to stop. Really? Okay, because I was going berserk. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, you got to look. 
someone shot a piece of me, which is over three quarters of me. Yeah. Do you want to give us our head? Okay. I tell her, I said, well, Mama, give me your address, <coughs> and we'll, we'll make a trip and go up there and give you the $200, and we'll just, you know, spend some time with the grandkids. She will not give me her address. And still to this day, she will not give me her address. Hmm. I can't beg her to give it to me. That's what you said. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I don't know. I don't know how y'all go to, uh, if y'all do find out something, I don't know how, if y'all can find out where she lives. All the thing I know, it's somewhere in Pennsylvania. Fantastically, the prosecution called Wayne Grimes a strange ex-wife who he had a contentious divorce with to testify against Wayne. And uh, this is, uh, I talked to Wayne's nephew of what, what happened at one point when uh, Pat, his wife, was out of the house and then Pat's two sisters took Josh over to the house to plant evidence against Wayne to make him look guilty. Was there a time that you were ever asked to submit an email? Yes, I was. Yes, I was. Well, not to submit an email. That was what they asked. They, they're kind of stupid about technology. But we were at the house. Wayne was not there. Um, this was uh, this was right after things started to get heated up about Wayne. And I, John's room was downstairs, kind of like in a basement area. And he had a computer there. And Wayne used that computer, and I was asked by Dale, she said, why don't you just put something on that, that computer to make it look like, you know, Wayne's trying to send an email to Sharon admitting that he murdered him, or something like that. So I told them I didn't know how to operate the, the computer. I just told them I didn't know. And I got a whipping over that day. My mother whipped me up. She said, I know you can do it. You did all this and you've done all that. So, yeah, that happened. Uh-huh. And and then we heard some connection with your case that there was people saying, well, we're going to get, if he doesn't do what we want, we're going to get him back. Well, that's, that was one thing my, that Jonathan's mother said. So she, she told me, she said, if you... Uh, If I keep having you, nobody else will. Said if you don't do it, if they are not allowing her tells you to do, it, then see, she, she told me she's I'm gonna go to Larry Davis and tell some things. And I had that on film, and I tried my best to get uh, uh, my attorney to represent it. It said that in court, she was trying to run over me, and I had it filmed at, at Jonathan's house. Uh, she was trying to run over in his driveway, and she said something about she want to go to the TBI. And I said, well, I said, I've not done anything for you to go big on TBI. I said, go ahead. She said, I know you've not done anything, but I'm going to tell you you did. And, you know, and, and that's what she did. And she said, if, if uh, I can't have you, so I'm going to see nobody else will. I had that on film. And, um, of course, God only knows where it's at now. You don't uh, know where it is? No, I don't know. I have a clue. But my stuff has been been scattered around. It was, uh, of course, I, I went through a divorce with my wife's wife since I've been incarcerated, which I don't hold anything against her. Right. Over that, I understand her position, but uh, she took a lot of my stuff to Jonathan's house, and then after Jonathan had his accident, uh, some of my family moved this stuff around different places, and I don't have a clue where it's at. But Larry Davis is deal that was want to try to get, he was trying to get the police department off from off from Charlie Anderson by saying that, but making allegations that uh, that they had took good guns out of evidence and sold them to Charlie Anderson. Right. And uh, that, uh, you know, Larry Davis had access to all of that. And that, that. This happened within like a week after the police department was, was split up uh, when, they, when they brought charges against, uh, against Kevin Kill, one of the, one of the deputies uh, for the police department. 
about being a, about being an alderman. Now, what was the thing with Robert Meeks again? I want to be very clear about oh. that. Did it have to do with the chemical dump, or was it just the dump, or what was it? Yeah, they was uh, they had tried to get me to come to me uh, and try to get me to go along with with them and uh, letting them bring some stuff into the Grand the Grundy County, and I would wouldn't go along with that. And I, they did find a chemical dump over. I, not too far from my house after that and I don't know whether that was some of the what, what had been brought in there during that time or what mm -hmm. but uh, the, you know some county officials had come come to me and want me to want me to vote to try to try to help them help them get some get some stuff going on and, and, and by uh, going on I just, you I just flat refused and by, I refused to do it and by going on you mean bringing chemical dumps or some kind of thing you know for so people could make some money yeah right it, it was about it was about making about making money and uh, of course uh, the sheriff I made the mistake of filming him with one of his mistress he was running around and popping his mouth off to me with some stuff and I let him know that I took some pictures which I did with a long distance camera right. and uh, he, he didn't like me on account of that either so uh, right but I didn't, oh, cool. didn't make a big deal out of that, and I, you know, maybe that was a, that was a mistake on my behalf, but I just got tired of him acting like he was an angel all the time and, and uh, bad mouthing me, and I just, you know, I guess it's just some, this was some people that come in to, come in to uh, the county, uh, wanting to come into the county, uh, and uh, I forget exactly who, who, who they were really uh, some people somebody from uh, up in East Tennessee was wanting to bring some stuff to dump in Grundy County I forget the names right off mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it, I was approached with it and, uh, and they were going to pay certain people who had land or something yeah that, that I, they were going to start dumping some things into the county into the landfill into and the that, landfill uh, do you know what yeah. it was? Any idea it what was, it was? Oh, I don't have a clue what it was. They just said said, said that they had had some had some uh, trash that they need to be brought in or garbage from other places, in which I knew that it was, it was something illegal. Right. I didn't know that. I, I got I got enough out of it that I knew that. Yeah. And uh, so. Uh, I knew that in similar counties around there, there people were being poisoned and uh, are maybe continuing to be because the water gets poisoned when that happens. Uh, serious, yeah. serious problems. Yeah. Oh yeah, her her uh, and his only sister came over there, and of course. At that time, Patty let me know that I'd had a, a quarter of a million dollar life insurance policy on me. And she had told me that uh, her oldest sister was trying to get her to help her cash in on it and split the money on, on, the, on the life insurance policy. And, uh, I mean, I was always trying to help people, and I might have went, at, went over there and tried it. If she had not told me, I guess that was just a blessing that she did tell me uh, at that time. Because uh, I would have more than likely went over there and tried to try to fix a flat tire for somebody, and, and, and most likely got killed. And she tried to get me. She come to the came to the house and tried to get me to go over to the old Rootley Ball Field, and uh, said she had a friend over there had a flat tire and said she didn't have no jack. And I said, well, I said uh, I'm busy, and, and it, it really dawned on me at that time that what she was trying to do. And I was, I was tied up. I don't know what I was doing at the house, but I said, I'll, I'll, I'll just let you take my jack over there and let them use it. So um, probably 30 minutes later, she comes back and says, I need to get you to come over and help us fix that flat uh, on that on that car. I said, uh, we don't have no lug wrench. I, and then that's when it really dawned on me what they were trying to do. I said, well, here, I've got, I've got a lug wrench. Just take it with you. And that's what I did. But that's what they were trying to do, setting me up to knock, knock me, you know, knock me off that night. Yeah, just the mere fact that they let her testify seemed very, uh, once I really talked to Jonathan, I thought that was really odd that they let her t testify at all. 
Um, well, she shouldn't have. She really wasn't mentally stable enough to do it. But they, according to the DA, you know, Taylor gets up there and he, he says she's the most sane person in the world. You know, hear him tell it. Um, but uh, he, he would make you sick just to listen to him talk. You know, everything was so just, everybody was just so innocent. And it was just so, you know, um, nobody had no motive, had no malice toward me or anything to hear him tell it, but, but they did. Right, and I wanted uh, I wanted to ask you about that just a little bit, a um, um, couple things, and <clears throat> when when your wife was getting uh, sicker, right? The uh, you know, like uh, what steps were you taking to um, get her better? I guess. Um, well, she uh, she committed herself. Uh, we were riding down the road one day, and all of a sudden, she just threw her pocketbook out the window. And uh, I stopped, got in the ditch line, and we went and just left home. And first, I don't know where she was, just didn't want to go. Or what, I don't remember remember really what set her off. Uh, but she threw it out the window, and I, I went out, got out, and went out in the ditch line and picked her pocketbook up. And it, of course, it threw everything in it out, and I picked it up. And uh, tried to clean it up best good, and uh, I had mud all over me. It had been raining, and uh, I went back home uh, to change clothes. And when I came back out, her in the car was gone. She, she, she stayed in the car, and the next thing I knew, she was in McMinnville. Uh, she had committed herself in a mental uh, ward at the hospital down there for the mentally sick, and uh, then uh, of course. After that, we followed up. Uh, after we got her home, we, I would take her, I don't know, it was like maybe once a month, once every two weeks, we would go to a psychologist or psychiatrist and have joint sessions uh, with her. And even uh, a time or two, uh, Jonathan, his sister, was involved in it. And uh, we, uh, she finally just got mad one day and said she wasn't going back no more. Said, and I asked her why. She said, well, you, for one, talk about me. She said, you talk too much. And <laughs> so uh, anyhow, she just would find a reason, you know, just find a reason just to quit taking any therapy. Said it wasn't right. Said she didn't really need all that. And then uh, she would, uh, wouldn't take her medications for months at a time. She would just quit taking her taking her medication, said that uh, it wasn't right for her to have to take medication. I said, but if you need it, there's nothing wrong with it. And uh, she would just flat refuse you. She said, well, she would tell me she didn't need it, but yet you couldn't live with her. She was, like I say, you could walk through the house one minute, she'd be as good as you could ask for her. The next minute, she might try to take a knife, cut your head off. Yeah. And uh, she said she heard voices. Uh, so, uh, I don't know, we tried to help her, but you know, you, you can't help someone if they don't try to help themselves. You yeah. know, they've got to be willing to let you help them. And Jonathan said uh, that, uh, I, I, Jonathan said that she would watch TV and thought that what was going on in TV was happening in reality. Oh yeah, yeah, and she, she told me that uh, our daughter, Jonathan's sister, we, we lost an automobile accident coming home from college. Uh, she uh, told me a month or two after her death, said that she she would come in there and sit and talk to her. Said said Reba, Jonathan's sister, would come in and talk to her for two or three hours at a time. Uh, you know, and I, and I got I would tell her I said, but no, no, that's not real. She, she, you know, you're having to imagine that because that's you know that she, she she's you know she had we had lost her in a car accident, and she, and sometimes she would ask me. She say, but well, did you, did I ever really have a daughter, she would say, and stuff like that. And um, then she would get mad at me a lot of times and wouldn't speak to me for two or three weeks at a time. Um, but she would tell me she heard, heard voices, and that's what she said. She said, if you really knew what went on in my head, said you would know I was crazy. And said, I hear your voices talking to me all the time. I mean, she was really, really sick. And uh, right. I... I dealt with it to the point that she finally got so dangerous I couldn't couldn't really live, live with her. She tried to pause me several times. Uh, she uh, would take and uh, you know, get mad at me and tell me I'd go lay down to sleep sometime at night and I'd wake up she'd be standing up over me looking at me. And um, I mean it just got to the point uh, that uh, I guess I, I couldn't couldn't deal with it you know, any, any longer and, and, and feel safe. And 
she I was the only thing that was still between her running and my daughter off before her death. I mean she she was the enemy before she passed away and she went after she didn't have her to argue and fuss with then she would she turned on me. And after I finally couldn't stand it any longer, Jonathan stayed for another two or three weeks or a month at home and he said he got some point he couldn't deal with her. The situation uh, with the police departments getting disbanded, and um, and Mr. Lane did get off, and so did 32 other people got out of their charges because of that, according to the article. Well, the police department had, had charges against all of the, the, the city officials, uh, family, with the exception of mine, you know. And uh, that was the reason to get rid of them, because uh, they didn't want, want them to appear in court against them. Yeah. Uh, they wouldn't play for politics, I guess you could say. And then they didn't appear in court. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a second article. Um, did you ever talk to that writer, the AP writer, about that? or did, 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 did you uh, No. Okay. I, I, I was not aware of there was, a, there was another article on it. Yeah, there were two articles uh, uh, by you know an Associated Press writer, not you know because they they found it pretty strange, you know, um, what was going on, and and we saw that going on in Adams' case, you know, when you know the drug dealers were taking over. Um, Back, I think sometime that you uh, did you have some dealings with Larry Davis at all? Or, or he, my my mother's house and her parents, Watt and Dot, their home was walking distance from each other, and there were many times Larry Davis came down to talk to Deb, my mother, and Pat at my grandmother's house, and uh, I would hear what they would. You know, they would talk about it. My mother was obsessed with this this shit of, of going after Wayne and all this. And that's how they work. If they get obsessed about something, they're going to do everything to ruin you. They're going to do everything they can to make your life as miserable. It's covert. It's it's ugly. But, uh, yeah, I remember Larry David. And Deb was terrified of Larry Davis. She used to say, he scares the shit out of me. Because, you know, she'd been in lots of illegal shit herself, you know. Mm hmm um, but Larry Davis had made the comment. He said, I don't care if Wayne Grimes did it or not. I'm going to get him one way or another. That was his exact wording. I remember it. I remember my mother saying that that's what Larry Davis said because they were bantering back and forth about the conversation they had with Larry Davis. You were, you were there, right? I was not present when Larry Davis was there. Okay, you were not present from Larry Davis? I wasn't present during that conversation, but I remember my mother bragging and talking about it to Deb and to Pat I see. in the house. When I heard my mother say that, and she was like, yeah, Larry Davis said he's going to get him one way or another. Okay. All right. And Deb asked Pat, how much do you think his construction business is worth? This was before the divorce. This is before anything was going on. And Pat said, I don't really know. I don't know because Sharon keeps the books. And Deb said, you better find that out because it'd be nice to get a piece of that. I remember that. Uh -huh. And uh, this was about money. This was about, you know, after they've used you up, you got to be discarded. You got to go to prison. You got to die. Or you got a divorce was not an option. I don't know why they just couldn't divorce people instead of you know doing all the other shit they do to people. Interesting. So wow, that's very uh, terrifying. Like that, and then yeah, Tracy City Pharmacy. Yeah, it was a Tracy City Pharmacy. Uh, if, if there was a restaurant attached to it, there was a walkway, and it was on the far left side. There was a booth, and they were talking about this thing with Wayne. I, you know, we got to do this. Can we do that? I, you know, I remember bits and pieces of this on on everything. And this is before Pat had decided she was going to testify against Wayne. This was way before. This was like the the, the divorce initial stuff. Bef it was before that, you know? It was before um, they were divorced? Yes. Oh, yes. The divorce wasn't finalized at this point. It wasn't finalized. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't finalized. I remember that as clear as day. And I remember 
uh, Deb looking over and saying, we should take care of Wayne like we did Farrell. My mother froze in her fucking tracks. She had this look on her face of, oh, shit. And Pat didn't say anything. It was just this moment of silence. And, and here I am, a 15-year-old kid. I, you know, I weigh 96 pounds soaking wet. I'm, that fucked with me. And I have told my therapist about this. I, I What that meant, I don't know. Yeah. But I just know that it, it scared me. Sure. You know? Yeah. 